Do you know your risk posture? With Crossbow, you can run and analyze adversarial campaigns in real time against your production infrastructure to validate your intrusion detection, antivirus, phishing protection, and incident response. Know your cyber exposure with Crossbow. Hey, we're here at, well, it's the tail end of Black Hat, the beginning of shenanigans at DEF CON. The beginning of shenanigans? Shena well, you're assuming that shenanigans always happen at DEF CON. That's true. They happen at all conferences, really. That's Usually true, ones yeah. that you and I attend probably win as well. There's some shenanigans going on. Wynn Schwartow's here with us. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you? Um, when we're going to talk about maintaining, just trying to maintain for the week. <laughs> what is your uh, advice for people to survive cons these days? Don't try to do everything. Create your own environment. Uh, meet a few good people. It's about the conversations, mm -hmm. not the masses. I agree. Um, nice said. We oh, thank you. We want to talk about the future of security. Um, so, what are some of the major changes you hope to see in security over the next five years? All right, this guy's me into my rant zone. This is absolutely yes. We perfect. want to be in your rant zone. <laughs> yes. Um, I fundamentally uh, shit's broken. Everybody agrees shit's broken. Yep. Yet the next generation of shit's going to solve everything absolutely because it's all about a technology problem, right? But, but yeah. And that's why we're at Black Hat and, and RSA mm -hmm. and all this and. That answer is wrong because fundamentally we are still using a security model designed for asynchronous communications developed in 1972 by Anderson. That is mm -hmm. where we still are, yet we're trying to do it at hyperspeeds mm -hmm. in a completely synchronous communications set of channels. Doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So over the last years, I've really thought about this a whole lot and drunk a few beers with some friends over the years and you and started re looking at things differently uh we don't have a metric really in the world of security and uh, very quickly time is a metric that does apply in security it applies in all communications it applies in risk it implies in applies in trust and inversely so in privacy Number two, if we start getting rid of zeros and ones, you're never going to be perfectly secure. You're never going to have 100% trust in people. If we get rid of these outer boundaries and look at the world of security as a continuum in the middle, there's some level of successes that we don't know how to measure yet. But using feedback and OODA loops and putting time into the feedback loops, suddenly new answers start appearing. You can measure the efficacy of uh, detection and reaction products, because protection is a failure. Defense in depth is a failure. You cannot protect, you can defend though, and you can quantifiably do it by knowing how to measure your detection and reaction. So we've been working on this for an awful long time, and uh, finally I'm gonna have a book coming out my first book in 15 years will be coming out uh, in a couple months now do we apply ai and machine learning to ooda loops yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely i mean you don't have to it's one of the options that after uh, we get this work out uh, th there's hopefully going to be a lot of controversy and people saying let me try it that's bullshit it's not going to work it's not going to work okay cool prove it does prove it doesn't let's evolve the idea because conceptually it seems to hold together very nicely now, when you talk about uh, AI in the OODA loops, I would argue that it wouldn't be specifically AI in the OODA loops because that would be more of a feed-forward business intelligence feed into the primary input. More like machine learning than AI. But the, in the yeah. feedback, it would be neural mm. because then you can have dynamic weighting going Bingo. on. Bingo. <laughs> Buzzword bingo, sorry. Oh, so, oh sorry. <laughs> I, I wasn't trying. I, I'm not a neural networking engineer, but I understand enough about them that you have multiple inputs, multiple variable conditions that are changing over time. And when you put that into the feedback loop, again, different sets mm -hmm. of criteria uh, and, and results start happening that become measurable. And then the concept of doing it in an OODA means you never can stop. You, right. you always have to keep going it over it. Yeah. All, and so these concepts are what we've been working on. And that's where I'm hoping in the next year to get some uh, space over at the Delta works in uh, Security Delta over in Holland mm -hmm. to do some prototyping. So how will the threats change over time? There, there's going to be weaponization of every technology you can possibly think of. I was doing a, a thing at an AI conference recently mm -hmm. and some guy was talking and I won't out him because he's a really good guy 
and he gave this talk and I said, I need to talk to you afterwards. I said, you forgot one piece, poisoning. And people are forgetting about the poisoning value of AI. It's kind of like a lowland attack that we see in conventional digital attacks, but doing it over time into the neural networks can mm -hmm. create distortions because they are not binary conditions. Perverse feedback, perverse uh, exactly. situations. And it's called poisoning. It's poisoning the network. Be Westworld, sort of? Ooh, good one. Um, absolutely, because if AI is done correctly and you've got proper neural networks, you don't have a binary function. Mm -hmm. You've got a set of a range. It's a potentiometer, it's not a, it's not a toggle switch. And you've got a lot of potentiometers in there yeah. because there's a lot of different conditions. You don't have just one OODA loop in security, you've got sub loops. Right. And so we're trying to design these architectures to give people a framework, a conceptual framework to rethink security completely from the ground up but still being able to live with TCP IP as the fundamental communications infrastructure and handling all of the routing for the security controls in an out-of-band channel with the new uh, protocol that we call the detection reaction interface. So um, as we move forward using technology and technology becomes more and more part of our lives mm -hmm. every day, how do we apply security? Like, if I look at a science fiction movie set 20 years in the future, I see people using technology, and there's like, like it's like we figured out magically this security problem. They're assuming, in a lot of that, and I love that analogy, it's, I mean, were, were the uh, Star Trek communicators ever intercepted by yeah. Klingons? I, right. you know, who knows? But there is an assumption of validity of technology in a lot of sci-fi. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. And I think if you ask any of the reasonable 25,000 people here in town, the answer is going to be bake in security from second one. Before you start mm -hmm. designing anything, make sure that number two criteria after functionality is security. Build it in from the beginning. And again, what we're trying to do today, back to this conceptual idea, is you can't build in a binary function. Mm. It cannot be. That's where we're failing. And so it has to be dynamic, completely dynamic. And we're going to have to build them in sooner or later because everything we're doing now, we know, doesn't work. Mm. I mean, there's lots of things that are uh, AI and machine learning has a lot of uh, security people working in that field. Mm -hmm. yeah, no. And there's it's very quick, very, I mean, they, they, people jumped on that one pretty quick. Well, it has a lot of money being funded into it by various government agencies, by various commercial entities, exactly everything. Yeah. And remember, Netflix started it all. So. <laughs> They're just, they're, well, their data set about how to make better decisions yeah. about movies really did start a lot of this stuff. So it, it's interesting to me that you say that it can't be binary. It's got to be more human-like, more analog rather than more digital. Well, what we've been trying to do is become like the computer versus the other way around. Oh, nicely said. Okay. And we are a neural network. We are not a binary computer. I just read an article about that somewhere. But, and I thought it was kind of backwards, though. Like, I always thought computers should just adapt to me. But there is this adaptation of you becoming more like a computer to interact with some kind of artificial intelligence. Well, it's not device. even the AI, because we're, I mean, the AI right now is actually better. Mm -hmm. uh, when I talk to my phone for I'm texting, uh, it's actually pretty darn good, but that's a very limited set of functions and doesn't apply immediately into security or to every, it doesn't adapt immediately to every other technology. And in that case, you can have far less than a Six Sigma result as well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter because you know, you're, you're fuzzy. But adapting a fuzzy mindset is also going to help with security and with future technology because they need to be integrated, as you said, right from the beginning. Mm. Um, do you want to do some hacker trivia now? Oh, Famous God. hackers. I, I, I'm going to embarrass. I'm going to get really embarrassed. I won't, you know what? I won't do all ten because I know you, you you get like antsy when I take too long with this segment. It's fine. Um, so I'll skip <laughs> around. I'll all skip right, around. Right. How's that? I'm going to okay. get embarrassed. You're, no, think. you're going to enjoy this. I promise. Okay. Right. So uh, this person, also known as the mentor, he was a member of a couple of hacker elite groups in the 1980s, most notably the Legion of Doom, who battled for supremacy online against the Masters of Deception. However, his biggest claim to fame is that he is the author of the Hacker Manifesto, which he wrote after he was arrested in 1986. Who is this person's name? I didn't know the Legion of Doom in those years. I didn't meet up with them until 
89 or 90. The fact that you can say that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I mean, I didn't, I, 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 the name, and the, I just don't remember his name, because I really got involved with Eric Bloodaxe mm -hmm. and that crew, which was like 90, 91. Came wow. after, right. Yeah. This was Lloyd Blankship. Blankenship. Blankenship. Right, I always say his I'm name wrong, too. On that. Poor Lloyd. <laughs> so sorry. Um, all right, what else have we got in here? Uh, okay, widely known as one of the fathers of the internet, he's the co-designer of the TCP IP protocols. Ben Surf. Yes, thank you. Very, very nice. Um, he was highly influential in the development of theoretical computer science. Neumann. Turing? Yes. All right, I mean, I mean Neumann <laughs> I was, was before Turing. I was waiting. <laughs> People, you're the second person to answer that after not even completing the first sentence, yeah. which I just, it gives me a high hope and humanity and the hacker culture well, that, you could also, that we I know mean, you this. Could, some people could also argue a little bit of Shannon. Mm. Keep reading. <laughs> There's another, never mind. <laughs> um, well, you know, so the other thing for the community, teach more history. Oh, dear God, I agree so much. Teach mm. some freaking engineering history. This is not software science, it's engineering. ICS and SCADA systems, we know how to build them. Mm. We don't know how to secure them. I, um, we, they, have, they have all the basic elements already there. And, and they're not being used correctly. That's a whole different story. Yes, yes, absolutely. But I mean, you know, how many talks have you seen in the last three or four years saying, hey, welcome to 1999 again? I kind of avoid those talks. Uh, there, there's not too much new under the sun, especially if a vendor is talking. But that's, no, even the non-vendor talks, it, it's literally like, look, these stuff that we did 20 years ago, guess what? We can do it again with the new stuff. Well, I, I mean, you go back to cyber war and information warfare, the stuff I did, what, 27 years ago. Yeah. And it was like, you know, it was a human pin cushion for about five or seven years. Because, you know, you're out of your mind. Mr. Schwartow, the congressman, said, why would the criminals ever want to use the internet? No, no that was not a quote. Was yes, it, it? is. 100% oh quote, no. Oh and it was God. congressman. It was either Glickman or Valentine. On, is that on, on public record? Yes, I want to get a it sound is. clip I, it's, of that. I have it all. It's probably, yeah, it's probably in the internet archive. I somewhere. have it. No, I have it. Just email me. And okay. I've got all of the digital transcripts from it. And the Do you have the video? Please tell me you have a video. No, we haven't been able to find it. Dang. Interesting. Uh, are we ready for one more trivia question? Because right, you know how much I love it. <laughs> a historically significant internet figure, he's renowned for first analyzing the Morris worm and his role in the Usenet backbone. This is not an easy one. He's also a member of the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee from 2003 to 2005. He's been an advisor for the National Science Foundation. This one's kind of general. I need to find some more, more specific, specific um, piece that I mean, doesn't give it away. I, that was it. Schmidt didn't do the how the the Morris worm. Who did? Who, who did? That's a good. That's a really good guess, though. Yeah, because yeah, Schmidt is not that technical. Or Gene, wasn't Gene Spafford? That was Spaff. You're like right in that the same. Yeah, that it was, was very close. Oh, yeah, shit, was I should have known that. Or yeah. Gene Schultz, because he was involved with that as well. Yes. Schultz. Yes. Okay, let's do one more trivia question. But wait, I've got it. Okay. Bug. That's the question. Where did the term come from? Oh, that came from uh, Admiral Grace Hopper. When? That was on the early, probably early ENIAC stuff or Colossus stuff when moths would get into the tubes. Yeah, exactly. And they'd short out the tubes. Yeah. There was one that actually shorted out in the, in the not, not in the tube itself, but in the, the socket. Yes, no, so it's not inside the vacuum tubes. Right. It's around the circuit. So one got yeah. stabbed. not plugged in all the way. You have a little bit of metal still picking out, yeah. which can short. And then one of them actually got stabbed by a tube because it was in there when they went to put the tube in, then turned it on, and it shorted out that tube, and the next tube, and the next tube. Yeah. I, I bowed a grace hopper. We were at uh, Harvard for B-Sides Boston, and there was a, a computer that they had shown the bugs in that was one of the computers that you mentioned. I forget which one, but we actually showed the bugs and the whole history behind one of the earliest computers. It was right there in Harvard where we had the, the conference. It was cool. Oh, that's cool. You know, uh, Matt Blaze, you know, the ENIAC is right outside his office. Is really? it? Oh, yeah. If you ever want to go oh, visit it, cool. come to Philly. Wait a minute. Blaze, I thought he's... Oh, I'm thinking Bishop. Okay, I was thinking Bishop out in California. No, no, no. Blaze, okay. I thought Blaze was in Nebraska. No, Matt Blaze is in Philadelphia. Okay. I've always... I guess We're I've just only... talking now. It's... Oh, <laughs> At UPenn. <laughs> okay. Why did I always run into him in Nebraska? You guys have weird habits. That's all I'm going to okay, say. No, <laughs> <laughs> Something about corn. Yeah, this corn's for yeah. you. <laughs> Win, thank you very much. Oh, no, this has been great. Thank you. Awesome.